Hey, this is Chris with Hilux Optics, and welcome to our podcast. In today's episode, we have our, a special guest, Nito Mortera from AP 2020 Outdoors. Hi, Nito. How's it going, guys? It's going well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, we are really, really happy to have you here, and we'd love to hear some of your experiences with uh, crossbow shooting. Um, I, I know uh, you uh, tested out our art crossbow scope, and uh, I would love to hear from a seasoned crossbow shooter what you think about it. Well, off the bat, um, it's pretty awesome scope. Uh, at first, there was a slight learning curve. You know, I had called you on a couple occasions trying to figure out what was going on, and that's one thing that um, people really don't mention about them. I mean, I do a lot of work for a lot of folks in the industry, and the number one thing that I always look for it's customer service, you know. You guys have you guys have some of the best customer service because you know, you know a lot of times there's people that are not experienced with a specific item, right? And if they don't get good customer service, you know they're gonna, you know, the way the internet is now, they're gonna talk about it. In fact, if you look at the number one complaint in our industry is bad customer service. So that's the first thing, you know. You guys obviously take pride in what you guys build. And that is greatly appreciated. I just want to throw that out there. Oh, thank anyway, you. Nico. Yeah. So, so talking about the, the art scope specifically, um, the manual was very well written, but honestly, after you and I went through the process of actually setting it up, it really, you know, typically it should take probably less than a minute to get set up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as I know now, you know, when I first looked at it, I wasn't intimidated, but I thought, oh man, this is going to be, you know, somewhat drawn out. But then as, as you spoke to me about what I needed to, to, to check and change, you know, I was like, man, this was a piece of cake. So, you know, that's good. Yeah. That's good. You know, so you, know, you, you got to think about, I mean, I'm an engineer by trade. I know you guys are probably engineers as well. And that's the hardest thing for engineers to do is communicate to the average person, you know, something that can be very technical and detail. And, you know, the average person, um, number one, they won't have the patience to try to figure it out, right? And, and number two, if they don't have the patience, you know, they're going to complain about it, whether they complain um, to themselves or worse, they complain to other people. So, you know, that, that's very important. You know, you, the technology is there and it also has to be user friendly. That, that's very key. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, definitely. The art scope, it looks a lot more intimidating than it actually is. The setup really, uh, aside from zeroing it, it's just turning one screw, getting your cam setting and locking it down and you're pretty much good to go after that. Right. Um, so Nito, I know you, you said you did a lot of uh, crossbow shooting. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with crossbows? Yeah, well, actually, um, well, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Yeah, so you can you oh, guys wow. hear me? That's a big buck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so full disclosure, um, I grew up in Ohio, and I've been bow hunting since 1974, okay? And wow. I've been fortunate and taken a lot of deer with my bows and arrows. And um, surprisingly, Ohio, back in the 70s, Ohio and Ontario, Canada were the only two places where you could legally hunt with a crossbow. I don't know if you guys know that or not. And it well, wasn't, I did not know that. Yeah, it wasn't until about the past 10 years the game department start realizing how effective crossbow crossbows are to manage deer herds. So just, just real quick, we'll go through some of these pictures. This is my largest buck I ever shot. I shot him with a Black Widow recurve at seven yards. With uh, These are handmade cedar arrows with turkey feathers and uh, a razor sharp broadhead that I hand sharpened with a bastard file and stropped with a leather you know, leather belt with valve grinding paste. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some some of the bucks I've taken over the years, primarily compound bows. There, there's a there's a great picture, 1984. <laughs> uh, some more bucks. That that was with the 1974 bear recurve. There's a muzzleloader. Another muzzleloader, shotgun. That's my man cave. I, when my wife and I built our house 25 years ago, I had put two heads up in the living room 
And then after that, for some reason, she wanted me to move him into the den. So, so uh, that was actually oh, a 4570. Hmm. And then there's there's my uh, actually I've only taken two deer with a crossbow, two bucks. I've taken a number of does, but. Um, mm -hmm. Do you still anyway, shoot compound bows right now, or are you mostly uh, like hunting with the crossbow? No, now? now now I'm strictly hunting with crossbows. So mm -hmm. let me uh, let me stop sharing my screen here. And, so your, and primary, the your primary reason for changing from the bow to the crossbow would be shoulder. Exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah, I, I <laughs> right. I mean, I've been I've been shooting uh, bows and arrows for you know 45 years, and I shot recurve longbows for you know maybe 15 years and yeah you know you know after a while your uh, rotator cuff gives out so yeah I definitely had to had to stop doing that stuff so but yeah you know it's still, there's still the challenges there you know uh, um, like I said crossbows are now as you guys have seen in, in the marketplace crossbows are the number one uh, archery weapon used across the country now. I mean, there's a lot of states that still use, you know, a lot of guys still have, I think at least out east where I'm at, <coughs> you know, out west are starting to be, you know, more accepted, I'm sure. There's some, you know, die, die in the wool guys that, you know, look up, down upon crossbows. But the, the younger generation nowadays, they're realizing that uh, crossbows are an effective weapon. It's, a, it's still a challenging sport. You know, you only get one shot, you know, typically, you know, Chris, as you know, with your Aculeus, you know, imagine if you're in a deer stand and you miss a shot, you know, how easily are you going to be able to recock that without being detected? Oh, yeah. You know, so typically that yeah, first shot, be gone. right, you, that first shot you have to make. So, yeah, de definitely uh, uh, crossbows are here to stay. There's no doubt about that. That's an interesting point. So, uh what are what are the typical distances that you see that you're shooting um, when you're in the deer blind when you're hunting with the crossbow? Uh, you know, tip, and, and that's a very good question because, you know, uh, crossbows can actually shoot, you know, accurately out to a hundred yards, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and therein lies the crux, is that most people don't realize, at least people that first get into archery hunting that a white-tailed deer or even a mule deer's reaction time could be less than a quarter second, okay? And that's probably one of the, one of the um, negatives in regards to these crossbows that are now shooting 400 feet per second, you know, is that you'll get, you'll get people out there that'll say, hey, you know, I can, you know, I can hit a pipe plate at 100 yards. I should be able to shoot a, shoot a deer at 100 yards. Well, the problem is, is that uh, a deer's reaction time is so fast even even a bow that's shooting 400 feet per second, by the time the arrow gets to that hundred yard range, that deer could have swapped ends, you know, could have taken a step. You could potentially gut shoot it, have a bad shot. Mm -hmm. So typically, I will not take shots over 40 yards, you know. 40 yards. So, so 40 yards is considered an ethical, the maximum. Uh, yeah. Now, 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 out honey out west, you know, if you're shooting maybe a California blacktail or you know, mule deer in Colorado. I mean, guys shoot 60, 70 yards with their compound bows, you know. So mm -hmm. I think the wind conditions are right. You know, if the deer is not alert or alarmed, you know, 60, 70 is still very plausible. So, you know, I'm, so the, obviously the different species makes a difference. Yeah, I appreciate the, uh, your conversation about that because that's the, the conversation Chris and I had had, you know, the ethical shot. Uh, and, you know, when we're talking about you know, hunters with, with the art scope, for example, because it does the compensation uh, and trajectory for you, you can typically shoot farther, more accurately uh, with, um, you know, under those kind of stressful conditions. And so you may, you may be uh, enticed to take a longer than, uh, what do you call it, longer than ethical shot. And so bringing that back down to understanding the game that you're hunting and uh, in this case, you know, you know, the crossbow that you're using to identify what that ethical range would be, even though the, your capability, yeah, I could shoot that far, but I'm making a conscious decision not to shoot that far. Right. Mm -hmm. not, not to say that it's, it's bad to shoot, you know, as a target shooter, you know, you could, 
you know, if you can shoot 100 yards and you're just shooting targets, 3D targets or whatever, you know, I think that's where the art scope really comes into, come, comes into its own, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at, and Chris, I'm going to kind of segue to maybe another topic regarding the crossbow mm -hmm. scope compared to other crossbow mm -hmm. scopes. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at uh, other crossbow scopes, they typically have the, uh, the graduations, you know, on the vertical plane. And they're marked off in specific, you know, distances. Whereas with the, what's nice about the art scope is that, you know, and I'll tell you this from experience as a hunter, I'm, I never go anywhere without my range finder. So I know within, within a 10th of a yard, how far my, my uh, game is or my, my target is. And so that's one of the, the uh, downsides of a typical quote, uh, conventional crossbow scope nowadays is that you don't get that fine, you know, typically it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 yards, right? Mm -hmm. With the art scope, you can actually go down to the yard, right? Not just the tens of yards. You know, you go 30, 31, 32, 35. Whereas if you had a, a, a standard, a, a classical traditional crossbow scope, let's say you got a deer at 35 or 38 yards, right? So you're in between 30 and 40 yards. Where do you actually you know, where do you actually aim? Because now you don't have a, a fine aiming reticle to use, right? Mm -hmm. You have to somewhat guess between that 30 and 40 mark where 38 yards is at. Whereas with the art scope, it's, oh, I just got dialed to 38, aim dead on. And as, as you guys are, are shooters, you know, most shooters that use a scope, it's, it's more natural to aim with the center of the reticle as opposed to trying to aim off the center of the reticle, you know, so that's and also um, from, from an optical standpoint, the optic is the clearest and the sharpest in the center. So right. if you're using the hold offs, you're obscuring your field of view and also right. um, it might not be as, it might have some, a little bit of distortion or um, pin cushion. Right. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, so have you, have you uh, ever encountered a time in the field when you're using a traditional crossbow scope where you had to make the, the holds? Did you ever have difficulty like um, counting which pin was the right one to use or in the heat of the, the moment? Yes, that's, that's, that's very plausible because, you know, you know, um, you, know it's, it's, you, don't, you don't get that perfect shot. In most hunting conditions, you know, you, you've been sitting on stand for three or four hours, you know, you're bored out of your mind because that's essentially what bow hunting, archery hunting is. You know, it's just that typical, you know, uh, you know, 99% of the time you're bored out of your mind. And then that one, you know, you get maybe a 10 or 15 second window to actually take the mm -hmm. shot, right? So then your, your, uh, your buck fever kicks in, your, your pulse rate elevates, you know, your mind's racing, you get tunnel vision, you know, and, and the last thing you want to do is be able to focus and try to figure out, you know, which reticle to use to make that shot. And yeah, I've shot, you know, I've shot at doe, you know, female deer, you know, in between ranges. And I had to second guess, you know, and, and actually look through the scope and focus and count from the, you know, you would think three or four tick marks from the vertical would be, you know, a piece of cake to count down. That's not when you're, you know, under a stressful condition, you know, you're trying to count you know, count down, okay, 20, 30, 40, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, Nito, you've just highlighted the value of the art scope. When it was designed, it was designed for combat situations. And as you can imagine, that's very stressful. And so not having to deal with holdover, not having to deal with uh, calculating range, that's the beauty of it. And being able to use that center crosshair and then you're just adjusting off your windage on that uh, horizontal crosshair so right. you, you have just eloquently stated the beauty and the power of the art system yeah i mean you know, I, when i when i test and, and and look at things i always try to everything i always gear back to being as a hunter you know what you know how effective is this you know as, as a as a as a shooter and a hunter you and just like any anything else you want to eliminate all the variables to where if you miss a shot, you miss a shot because it's strictly on you as a person missing the shot. You know, you never want your equipment to fail on you. You know, you don't. Because that's yeah, something you have to, you know, that's something you can actually control very well is your equipment. 
controlling yourself can be hard at times, but you know, if that's the only variable you have, you know, you're better off. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, so I could, actually the next point I kind of wanted to transition to was uh, maybe some of the setup. Uh, I know during the setup, we, we kind of figured out that because we're shooting, you're shooting a heavier bolt, your bolt was retaining more of the velocity down range. Um, uh, how actually did you use a chronograph when you when you uh, determined that or yeah yeah so i have a in my basement i have an indoor shooting range both mm. archery and uh, rifle and so oh, I, have wow. a, I have a chronograph which i tested and then as a as a double check um i don't know if you know how learned you are in archery in general how um you know like the ibo how arrow speeds are standardized uh, versus a specific bow and draw length. So, you know, not just the crossbow manufacturers, but the longbow slash vertical uh, compound bow manufacturers will set up their IBO, International Bow, bow Hunters Organization Speed. And it's just a speed rating of, of a, a specific bow, or whether it's a vertical bow, recurve, or crossbow. So I had, I had known that my Scorpia Death Stalker, you know, would shoot at a specific bow weight a specific arrow weight, a specific velocity. And typically with crossbows, it's a one to three ratio. So for a, a, a delta or a change in three grains, you'll get a, a delta or a change of one feet per second, okay? So if you gain or lose nine grains of arrow weight, it's about three feet per second. So then, mm -hmm. My specific arrow is a 440 grain arrow and I'm shooting 353 feet per second. And I checked it against the IBO rating of my Scorpia Deathstalker and it checks out within like one, one to two feet per second. So that's just a final check aside from a chronograph. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like your Aculeus, I think that's what, 400 to 440? Uh, 440, 460. I believe like 460, 460. Yeah, four because I have an Aculeus too. I think it's 460 for a 400 grain arrow, I think, something like that. Yeah. So. Uh, I think we got, we were shooting uh, with a target point. We're, uh, we weighted around 530 grains, and I think we're getting around 382 or 383 feet per second. Right. Which, is a, so, what, which is a heavy, you know, that's a, that's a relatively heavy arrow, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. if you think about uh, it, if you if you did the math, what what was your weight? Five what? I think like five hundred thirty, or right right around there. So what's what's uh one thirty divided by three? Forty. So, uh, uh, forty-three. Forty-three. So then, if you if you uh added forty-three feet per second to the velocity you get, that would probably probably be the I IBO rating of your Aculeus. So were you shooting about what four hundred what? Uh, we're, we're actually, we're, we're shooting around like 385. So actually I, I'm not a hundred, but don't quote me on the three, three, five thirty. It might be like 580. I, I forget exactly. Okay. But, but anyway, so, so just to let you know, and, and th these, this is a relevant discussion because as I found out, you know, when I initially set up the, the art scope, um, and, and, and I think this is very relevant too, because most experience, not just crossbow hunters, but archery hunters in general, they will shoot a heavier arrow than what the IBO rating is, is set at, okay? So like for vertical compound bows, that is typically five grains per pound, okay? So like on a 70 pound vertical bow, that, that IBO speed rating is based upon 70 pounds times five grains is based upon 350 grain arrow, okay? Mm -hmm. Crossbow manufacturers uh, like Scorpion or Ten Point or you know whoever may base may base their speed rating on a 375 grain or 400 grain arrow. In reality, most hunters will shoot a heavier arrow. Okay, mm -hmm. classically, just just because you know number one. Over time, if you sh if you continue to shoot a, a lighter arrow in your bows, you will accelerate the rear on your the wear mechanically on your bows, because you know physically a heavier arrow will absorb 
more of the energy versus a lighter arrow. And that energy, mm -hmm. instead of being, you know, translated into the cams, the strings, the limbs, is that, you know, going to be translated into the arrow itself. Uh -huh. And going downrange to the target. And going downrange, right. You know, obviously, you know, now you're looking at um, a heavier arrow has a higher uh, sectional density. If we talk about bullets now, okay, uh, projectiles, a heavier bullet or projectile or arrow is going to retain relatively higher velocity versus a lighter, you know, um, lighter projectile. That's just, you know, that's just physics. Mm -hmm. And that's where we'll segue into what happened with my personal experience is that when I look at the chart on the art uh, manual, my user's manual, so I started out, so for a 440 grain arrow at 353 feet per second, I think I started out at 31 on the, mm -hmm. is that the trajectory cam? Yeah, on the, yeah. the, on the calibration cam. On the calibration cam. Or calibration sorry, ring. Sorry. Yeah, the calibration ring. So I started out at 31, but then I ended up having to actually, as I start shot out to, to 40 and then 60 yards, I, and per, you know, your recommendations in the manual, I had to bump that number up to, to maintain my zero. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, you know, that maybe, that's maybe is a, a relative point is that, you know, the heavier arrows are going to maintain their, their velocity uh, better downrange, which obviously affected mm -hmm. the camp setting. You know, and that's, that's one of the beauties of the cam. So going back to historical, um, we had one cam, you know, for one round when it was on the M21. And then uh, my father and Chris's father uh, came up with the idea of a multi-cam, uh, but they still had teeth. Uh, and so when you were doing your adjustments, the, you could only get so much adjustment out of the, out of the trajectory ring and the camming system. And then we went to the pressure ring and that's where you can fine tune it. And there's a rule of thumb, if you shoot high, go high. So move your um, you know, calibration ring setting higher. And then, or if you shoot low, go lower. So shoot high, go high, shoot low, go low. And now with that pressure plate, you notice it's very smooth versus we no longer use the teeth. And you can get some great fine tuning. And just like what you did uh, working with Chris, as you go down range, you say, okay, where am I hitting? And then you adjust that, that calibration and you can really dial in your system. So. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So uh, one, one thing I actually I'm curious about is I, I, I do want to take a, a deer with this crossbow someday. And uh, I presume I'm going to be using a broadhead versus a target point. So have you right. noticed any change in the trajectory when you're using a broadhead versus a target point? So th that's a good question. Um, because of the relatively higher speeds that crossbows can generate versus vertical bows, um, number one, I would recommend a mechanical broadhead without, without a doubt. In fact, most guys that shoot these high performance crossbows are shooting a mechanical broadhead. Uh, why? Well, obviously if you shoot a fixed blade broadhead, you have now introduced a, an aerodynamic surface on the front of your arrow, okay? And if your arrow is not leaving that crossbow, uh, well, I shouldn't say perfectly straight because all bows, whether it's a 30 pound, you know, Indian longbow or a, you know, 180 pound high performance crossbow, all arrows have what they call archer's paradox. Are you guys familiar with that term? Um, no, actually I'm not. So archer's paradox, is if you can imagine just a, a quick physics uh, uh, explanation here. So your arrow weighs how much? This one Five, actually 570. 570. And you have, do you have 100 or 125 grain field point? I, I think this is actually like a 200 grain field point. Okay, 200. One. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have almost 40% of your total arrow weight concentrated where? On the, on the front. Uh, at the at the tip. So what happens with Archer's Paradox, is it's a pretty cool phenomena, is that as your, as your string starts imparting all that force on the knock end of your arrow, 
okay? Mm. The momentum of that force, it actually causes your arrow to flex. Because as your arrow starts accelerating as a whole, the mass of your point, okay, as the arrow clears the riser, the arrow has to flex. And they've discovered that you have to have Archer's Paradox for an arrow to fly perfectly straight within six or seven feet down range. Mm -hmm. Like if you shot an arrow that was that was that had a a, a a very high stiffness rating, okay, that arrow, because of the physics involved, that arrow would come out of the bow and it would come out not sideways, but it would come out um, it would not it would never recover and would come out at some angle, which is bad. So mm -hmm. so getting back to your getting back to uh, what broadhead you should use, what happens is if your bow is not perfectly tuned, meaning that the arrow is not coming straight out of your bows, it, let's say it's coming out at a two two degree angle, right? Let's say two degrees mm -hmm. at three o'clock. Let's say the knock end is two degrees off from the from the point end. Well, if you have mm -hmm. a fixed blade on the front of your arrow, the aerodynamics of those blades are going to steer the arrow, and you'll miss. You know, down mm -hmm. range, you'll miss. Yeah, yeah. Right. So definitely, you're going to hunt with your crossbow this year. Definitely use uh, mechanical broadheads. And I won't. So the difference tell you between which a mechanical and a fixed. What's uh, that? It's like the mechanical. The difference between a mechanical broadhead and a fixed broadhead um, is that is the mechanical one like closed on, upon shooting and it opens up or? Yeah. So so typically. There are two types of mechanical broadheads. Uh, typically, the, the, the initial, the classical mechanical broadheads were open. Um, they would actually, the leading edge of the blades that were exposed, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever target was contacted, it would force the blades open. And those okay. were called over the top, okay? So over top, over the top, I don't know if you could see my hand here. So over the top, the, let's say th there's the arrow right there. Over the top, the blades would swing like that, okay? Mm -hmm. And then they discovered, like I would say the Gen, Gen 2 or Gen 3 mechanical broadheads, the broadheads would deploy um, from front to back. And the reason why that's relative, the over-the-top broadheads were, were deemed um, uh, defective on a, a quartering shot quartering angle shot. So let's say you have a you have a deer that's quartering away from you and you're shooting an over the top mechanical broadhead what happens is when that when that when the leading blade which is closest to the animal when that blade mm -hmm. contacted the hide it would actually cause the arrow to cartwheel. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So that's way that that's when another company came out with a a blade that would deploy from front to back, meaning that the blades would not deploy over the top. I see. So great. And, so yeah, this is all this is all very interesting. I I you know we can appreciate the science. You know we've you know our primary focus has been in ballistics and in the rifle shooting. Uh, so well, I'd like to talk about that next. <laughs> yeah. I Chris. Chris brought up some talking points about what to talk about and what I like to shoot. And, and uh, mm -hmm. if you look at my YouTube uh, uh, description, I, any, if it shoots a projectile, I, I'm into it. <laughs> there, there, there's a guy at SHOT Show that wanted me to do some uh, high speed photography on his slingshot. So I'm still, I'm still waiting to do that. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. I, I, I did see your high speed uh, camera footage of the, of the bow and I think I did see it kind of like flex a little bit like the bow the arrow kind of leaves at it like an angle and it corrects itself during the flight yes is that okay yeah so that's called archer's yeah, so that, paradox. that's an archer's paradox okay. right right and in fact if you look at if you look at any uh I mean you can get on YouTube and just type in archer's paradox but mm -hmm. if you look at um you look at uh any any of the finger shooters you know guys that shoot a bow mm -hmm. and arrow people shoot a bow and arrow with just their three fingers when they when you release the bowstring, you actually impart um, lateral archer's paradox. Lateral meaning that the arrow actually flexes in the horizontal plane. 
So you'll see the arrow flexing from three o'clock to nine o'clock and back. Whereas, whereas, mm -hmm. have you ever shot a, a compound bow? Uh, no, I have not. It's so, on my list though. So, so if you ever shoot a compound bow, they have mechanical releases, a, a caliper release that actually clips on the bow string. And if you look mm -hmm. at if you look at that archer's paradox, uh, what happens is when when the bowstring is released, you get a porpoising archer's paradox to where the arrow is actually porpoising 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock and back. But it's all critical. You have to have that archer's paradox. I mean, you can have, you could shoot an arrow that's way too stiff, okay, for, and, and when I say stiff, it, I mean exactly what I'm saying is that it does not flex as much as an arrow that's, you know, not, not as stiff. And to put mm -hmm. that in context, let's say an adult, a man, a, adult man's bow shoots 70 pounds, right? It would shoot a specific stiffness rating arrow versus a kid's 30 pound recurve. You know, mm -hmm. you're gonna have, that's a, that's a huge difference in bow weight and bow force on a specific arrow. Now crossbows, mm -hmm. um, Crossbows are, are a little bit different animal. Um, you know, typically we only shoot 20 to 22 inch long arrows and they're typically mm -hmm. spined pretty darn near close to each other, you know. So it's not, it's not as big a factor. Uh, I guess the biggest factor with crossbows is if, if they do go out of tune, if your cams do go out of tune, you will have, you will have issues because it's, you know, you're shooting at such a higher velocity you know, you're creating so much more, uh, relatively more kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. That's all been very, very interesting. I, I, I definitely need to do some more uh, shooting with a crossbow. And I, I would like to shoot a compound bow sometime just to get uh, the, the feel of it. Oh, yeah. Do it, do, it do it while you still got your rotator cuffs. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's fun. It's fun to, it's fun to watch it. You know, uh, like I said, I, the two biggest bucks I ever killed were with a recurve, you know, with a, a bow like Robin Hood, you know, you know, it's, wow. you know yeah, it's crazy. You know, it's like, you know, I actually killed, I killed a doe with a, a, a handmade, an Osage orange longbow that my friend taught me how to make, you know, it took me like wow. 40 hours to, to make this, uh, hickory, this or hickory, hickory backed Osage orange longbow, you know, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun, you know, that, just another thing. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I know you, you were mentioning we, in our previous conversation, you were talking about you had a, a cool project, upcoming project on your uh, your 3040 Crag. Um, yeah, so, and I think we have the perfect scope for that. Okay. Uh, let me actually, let me bring it on camera and show. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Can you just hand it to is... me? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So this is actually our, so let me see, make sure it's safe. Yep. So this is our, uh, oath, we have an O3 Springfield and uh, this is our, our reproduction of the A-Power Unertal Scope. So we call it our Malcolm A-Power and it's got our new mounts on it um, for vintage sniper competition. So I, I think this is a uh, typical on the, of, the, of the rifles that you see during like oh, World War II, uh, all the way up to Vietnam. And uh, it's interesting. This is an externally adjusted scope, so you can see everything, um, all, the, all the adjustments that you're making. Uh, you're actually making the adjustments to the, the tube itself. And uh, we took this out um, last week, and I actually learned a lot about it. So the zero, or your point of impact, is uh, really critical on your cheek position and your eye position. When you're making adjustments to the scope, you're actually, you have to actually physically change your eye position too. So getting everything lined up and all those like minor details are absolutely critical. But it's tremendously fun to shoot, and um, something else I, I had uh, had to remember was when you shoot, the scope kind of moves forward, so you have to like pull it back and reset it to battery, as they say, and to, that way you get a consistent return to zero every time. You don't have a spring? Oh, you actually, yeah, we do have the spring. So this is the configuration for the vintage sniper competition. Okay. Uh, but uh, with the, with the re return spring, you would actually, so we have two uh, stop, stop rings right here. You would just adjust the, the rear one backwards and uh, you can put the spring in there. So the spring would stay over here and the scope with, with the recoil would bring the scope back when you have this return spring in. 
Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, when we get you yours, I'll be sure to set up set it up at the screen. Okay, so you 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 guys want to hear my neural story? Yeah. So so about twenty five years ago, um, I started getting into groundhog hunting. You got, you guys probably don't have groundhog. You probably have marmots out there, don't you? Rock marmots. We. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know we do have a uh, uh, like prairie dogs. Yeah, you have uh, some, prairie some, dogs. Like, Right. So, so a, a marmot or a groundhog is probably about four or five times the size of a prairie dog. I mean, okay. you can get a, you can get a male groundhog that's maybe you know fifteen pounds. So they're they're pretty. We we hunt them out here in Ohio. They're varmints, right? So mm. twenty five years ago, I acquired a a a, a Mauser ninety eight and a twenty five oh six built in nineteen fifty two. It had a a number eight. Um, Fajin, no, it had a number eight uh, Douglas barrel and a Fajin stock, a Kanjar two ounce set trigger, and it had a 15 power, 15 power unertal two inch barometer scope. And it's one of these, one of those guns where I regret that I got rid of. In fact, I sold mm -hmm. the rifle and then I sold the scope, you know, as a, in my misspent youth, I needed the money for something else. And I wish that's one of my biggest regrets is selling that rifle and that scope. As you know, as you guys know, you know, to find a unural scope nowadays is just ridiculous. You know. Oh yeah, it's just, it almost like you just have to find an estate sale and see someone who had a bunch, and that, that's that's pretty much the only way. Or uh, it's kind of morbid, but you have to wait for someone who has it to to pass away. Right. Right. Yeah, so when I, you know, in fact, that's how I found you guys. I was just looking up stuff on the internet, and I'd seen Hilux, and then I was like, so when I saw your, I saw the 8X, I thought, oh, man, somebody's making repro, you know, you nerdles, you know, and, and then as, you know, I finally called you, Chris, up, and we started talking, you know, and yeah, mm -hmm. man, I mean, just the whole, you know, it's, it's, it's so, it's counterintuitive if you think about it, how, how the externally adjusted scopes, you know, came to being versus the, you know, quote, modern day, you know, internally adjusted scopes, you know, as far mm -hmm. as, as far as, you know, um, you're not moving, you know, the erector set internally you're moving versus moving the entire body of the scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, and, yeah. and on that, on that, with the, you know, comparing this with the art, the, the similarity is that it's an external adjustment. You know, here you've got your, you know, your externally, the, the difference with the art system, because you have the framing reticle, you're not having to count clicks. So with both systems, this one, uh, as well as, you know, the, the ones that have the uh, rector set and you're counting clicks to move the reticle internally up and down, you know, with the art, you're, it's, it's an external adjustment, but you're not having to count any of the clicks manually on it. But what, yes. what is your total, what is your total adjustments? I never, I don't know if you guys publicize that. What's uh, your total MOA? Or I, I need to double check whatever? this. I, I think we, we have around 70 MOA if you space it from 7.2 or 7.2 inches from center to center. Is that so the amount of adjustment you has depends on the, the mounting distance. I think if you mount it 5.4, which would give you a one third inch or one third MOA clicks, you might get a hundred MOA on that. So that's uh, is that plus or minus thirty five from the optical center? Uh, yes. So the total the total range. Total would be, ranges. Um, okay. And then you can also uh, you so you could also use different height bases. So if you use a taller rear base, that's the equivalent of using it's like using a canned rail. Yeah, like a twenty MOA rail, rail or whatever. Huh. Exactly. It's interesting. And same with the windage. So, uh, same with the windage and uh, it is a square bracket so uh, even if you push the windage to the side you should still have the same amount of elevation travel right and then the the ocular what is the diameter of the ocular on that so i, I mic'd it up i think the so the outer diameter of the ocular is a uh, um 20 let me check that 24 i think the lens itself is about one inch millimeter. yeah or four millimeters just, just uh, yeah just just under and then the objective is the lens itself is uh, I believe 32 millimeters. Okay. So that, that's for the eight power. It's a three quarter inch tube. 
Um, but uh, our we're actually coming out with the 20 power as well, and it's going to have a slightly larger objective, I think around 40 millimeters. So closer to that two inch barometer that I had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I would love to take a look at the rifle that you're planning to mount the scope on. Yeah, I don't know if we could, uh, let's see. Is, it, is this rifle showing up or not? It's sort of uh, invisible. Huh? <laughs> it's kind of invisible. <laughs> yeah, this is Zoom. I've got the, I've got the back. So here, right. do you see the trap door? Maybe not. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyways, my gunsmith gave me this rifle a couple years ago. Mm. Hang on. Yeah, so that's a that's an 1898 uh, uh, Craig Jorgensen. It's actually I did the serial number look up. It was uh, I think it was manufactured in 1903. Oh, so, wow. yeah, and you know. Um, Corbett, you can appreciate this. I see you wear glasses. I wear glasses. Chris, you're lucky you got 2020. I just got LASIK. <laughs> oh, you got LASIK. Well, you know, um, yeah, I wish I had the eyes I had as a as a kid because I don't. And definitely, uh, you know, the, the old saying is uh, you can't hit what you can't see, you know, rains true. So that's uh, I'm I'm very excited to see that uh that 8X, you know, mm -hmm. coming my way for this uh this Craig 3040 Craig project. So, so I, yeah, did, I, I can't did, wait to see. It. I, I did talk to my gunsmith yesterday. So uh, Jim, my gunsmith, Jim Cottle, he's a master gunsmith and he has, he has all the mounting blocks because obviously, you know, he, he did the, the Unertles and the Redfields and the Lyman, you know, scopes back in the day, you know, in the forties and fifties and sixties mm -hmm. to where they had to be barrel mounted. So he has uh, he has a mounting box, and he said, "Yeah, when you get the scope in, we'll have to do the, you know, we'll have to do the mock-up." Uh, speaking of which, what is the eye relief on that? So the eye relief on this one is about uh, three and a half to four inches. Oh, great! And, and then, uh, you should have a. Um, so basically, you can also adjust the position of the front stop ring. So uh, you can adjust that to kind of oh, move the yeah. scope front forward and backwards. Right. As long as it's uh, you set it somewhere along the Pope rib, uh, this rib up front right here. And then of so course you'll you should, be you'll be limited by your spring as well, right? Yeah, with the spring, uh, you uh, you you will still have a little bit of a uh, room for adjustment, maybe about like an inch. But right. with, without the spring, you, you you do get more adjustment for that, right. I believe. So I'm, yeah. I'm, kind of curious, I'm kind of curious, guys. What's, um, you know, Chris, you and I had talked about this, and unfortunately, because of this stinking coronavirus, we were going to try to meet up at Camp Perry. You know, because oh, I've, yeah. I've covered yeah. Camp Perry on my YouTube channel. It's only about maybe an hour and a half north of where I live in Ohio. So mm -hmm. definitely 2021, I want to, you know, well, you guys, you guys are at Shot Show, right? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'll have to, hopefully, if Shot Show is on next January. We definitely got to meet up, for sure. Absolutely, yeah. I would. We definitely have to meet up. Um, maybe we could do some shooting too in the desert. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. So, um, yeah, as far as what uh, the media day, or do you guys shoot out there? So uh, we're. I was thinking a lot of, I was talking to some other um, like friends of mine, they were thinking about meeting up uh, maybe a day early or, uh, and just doing some uh, media like sh photography and video okay, in the right. desert. We actually don't go, we don't, we don't go to a media day, but there's a ton of BLM land out there. Right. There you go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we definitely have to meet up and it's unfortunate that that Camp Perry got canceled this year or the national matches. Yeah. But we'll definitely be there next year. But so what, what else on the, on the, uh, so what is the exact term that you, is, is, is it the 8X Malcolm or what is that scope? How do you guys brand uh, we, that name? We, we call it the Malcolm 8X. Malcolm um, 8X. Mm -hmm. what, and then we, we will have a, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off there. Uh, I was going to say we, we will also have a, uh, another version of this coming out just uh the vintage sniper competition version but uh that, that one's probably going to be available later this year that it what is the history of the malcolm scope 
I think you guys talked about it on your website a little bit, but so was Malcolm the, the first original optics that was attempted so on a rifle? Right actually, it was uh, Morgan James. Morgan James was the first person. Oh, actually, I think uh, it was way back. Like somebody like Galileo had like the telescope, but then Morgan James was the first one to put uh, uh, like an optical sight that was suited for your, your personal eyesight and mounted on, uh, on a rifle. He was a gunsmith. And then I think uh, William Malcolm, who's actually based out of Syracuse, New York, he was the first person to, to build a, a rifle scope with an adjustable eyepiece, an adjustable diopter that could, okay. um, so you didn't have to, so before the like, scopes were almost like prescription eyeglasses, you had one made for your eyesight and you could oh, really? use it. Yeah, but now, um, nowadays, um, all the scopes have a, like a fast focus eyepiece or an adjustable eyepiece that you can dial in to get the reticle perfectly clear. What, so William what about Malcolm, what about par is there any parallax adjustment on those or not yes uh this this uh the malcolm 8x actually does have parallax adjustment so that's okay so um, it's on the, on the, it'd be actually very the useful to go over this so um the parallax adjustment on these scopes are like the original um unitals where you have to first take off the, wow. the sunshade so you have to unthread the sunshade first Let me oh, okay out. right so once you've removed the sunshade it'll expose the objective lens housing uh, this this black piece right here is the objective lens housing and as you notice there's a ring up here with a set of numbers um, if you if you rotate it clockwise you'll be pushing the lens out and that's uh, to focus for closer distances so what we recommend is you go to the range um, let's say at 100 yards or 200 yards or whatever distance you're shooting at um, just get it set up a target there and dial this until uh, the targets in sharp focus and then make a little mark with like white out on on the the ring over here so you remember and just uh it just has a reference point so in the future you can go back and quickly zero or dial it in or get it focused um if you want to focus at something farther away you would have to turn this ring counterclockwise but as you're doing that you'll notice there's a little gap that develops between the housing and the threads um, the, the older unital, like the varmint scope, actually had a different parallax design. But for the Malcolm or for the unital 8, 8x USMCs and our Malcolm 8x, um, you would actually have to physically press the lens housing in and make it flush with the threads, and that's how you set the the parallax. Huh. So moving the the front lens uh, changes the parallax setting. Interesting. Um, and then once you once you get it all dialed in, you can put the sunshade on, and it doubles as a lock ring. Okay. Yeah. So so I do remember the the two um, the. 15 power two or the barometer that I had, I remember it was just an external parallax adjustment on it. Yeah. Oh, external. Okay. So was it, I, I think the, I, I've seen um, like a Unertal 20 X. Um, it had like a, a difference a parallax system. There was like a ring that you turn, but yes. then it would actually move the, the, the housing itself. Um, right. It's like bolted on underneath. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There were fasteners on there. So, yeah. So um, our, 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 our Malcolm 20X is going to have the same, uh, the same system as that. But for the, the, our Malcolm 8X, we kind of kept it, um, uh, wanted to, we wanted to do a reproduction of the uh, Unertal 8 power USMC. USMC, right. Um, so obviously the lenses are modern. Uh, how, mm -hmm. As far as sealing, is it nitrogen purge, the whole, or how? So we do, we do seal it at the, or nitrogen purge it at the factory, but um, like the old scopes, urinal scopes, these are not sealed. Um, the reason for that is that, um, it, a lot of the times because the wire, the wireframe reticle is so fragile uh, and we just wanted to make it easy to swap out. And uh, one of our dealers actually does like custom reticles for this. So okay. although, although it's not sealed, um, we do purge it at the factory just to make sure everything's dry on the inside. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And actually, that, that, I'd say that was one of the downsides um, and one of the reasons why I think the, the Army and the military moved away from these externally adjusting scopes. Um, they make fantastic target scopes and they're very, very accurate, but in, in a jungle scenario or in a harsh environment, um, they could be like dust or grit that gets into the, the mounts and, and make, it, uh, not, make it difficult to, to operate. But I'd, I'd say in like perfect conditions, these these type of scopes are, are amazing. Like for like varmint shooting or for for um, target shooting. Right. Okay. Great. Cool. And I also know um, you mentioned that you have a Henry forty five seventy. 
Uh, I think we have the perfect scope for that too. We're actually working on a new one. Uh, you, you may have seen this. You have actually you may have seen this rifle on our channel for um, from our recent videos. But we, we've been doing some testing on this. This is our Malcolm uh, Six Power Two Tone. It's a reproduction of the Winchester A5. Um, uh, yeah, and it's a six power scope with uh, 18 inches or 18 inches in length. And um, yeah, we, we mounted this one on our Uberti 1885 high wall. Uh, we, uh, our, our high wall actually came with holes drilled, not from the factory. I think we, um, we just uh, drilled those for, to test them out. But uh, if, if you were to mount this, I would recommend drilling and tapping the barrel and mounting it level. But I think this would go great on your 4570. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, so I think you had told me earlier that the brass that's a that's a new addition, the front yes the front uh, brass. Our, 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 yes the so the brass end caps on this one is new. We also improved the mount on this. So our old mount was a caged uh, rear um, caged rear mount. So it's a circle in design, and if you use some windage adjustment, you would limit your total elevation travel. So this one is a little bit wider, so it gives you I, a little bit uh, a little bit more travel. I'd say you should be able to get out to like uh, let's say five hundred yards. Um, if you mounted it on the barrel. Oh, that's perfect. What is the spacing? So we recommend 7.2 inches oh, or seven and a quarter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if so that every division on the on the on the turrets would be a quarter MOA. So this one, quarter so MOA. these kind of scopes back back in the day, um, they did not have clicks. And if you're shooting a like that black powder cartridge rifle or any of those competitions, they don't allow click adjustments either. Oh, but uh, okay. they do the lock ring, so if you once you make your adjustment, you can turn the lock ring, and it'll prevent the, the turret from moving. So then, and how then, would uh, go? On, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, uh, I was just uh, going to say this is like the unital scope where you have to pull it back after every shot. Does that have a spring loaded too, or do you have to pull it back? This one doesn't have a spring. Uh, this because the scope itself doesn't have a poke rib. Uh, we okay, wanted to right. keep the appearance as similar as possible to the original Winchester A5, so we just uh, bolted on um, a lock, uh, sliding lock ring underneath. Right. And and what's, but, uh, a what's a tube diameter on that? This one's a three-quarter inch tube. It's a three-quarter. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a that's a beautiful. What what would a winch if you could find the equivalent Winchester scope? What would that be at price wise? Like, oh, <laughs> man. You can't couple, even couple, at least a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. That's a that's a gorgeous looking scope. That'll be that'll look nice on my forty five seventy. What's the mm -hmm. um same typical mounting blocks or different mounting blocks? So this one, uh, it, it does use the same mounting blocks. It uses a crescent cut. Our our new crescent six power. Our, our older six power short scopes and three power short scopes uses the the post the posit cut but um yeah the new one it uses the crescent cut and the new mounts what what's the eye relief i'd say the eye relief on this is about four inches four inches okay mm -hmm. and then something we didn't talk about but i assume this is also a fine crosshair the reticle yes the fine crosshair mm -hmm. this this scope itself actually is sealed oh so that is one, sealed this one is sealed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about for the folks out there is um, what kind of warranties do you guys offer on your products? We, we offer a lifetime warranty. Uh, basically, if anything happens to you in the, in the field, we'll, we'll cover you. Um, awesome. uh, outside of like just improper use of you, as long as Dropping you're not using it as a cliff. camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. Right. I mean, even like for, we would do, we, we are very uh, generous with the warranty. So if like, if it falls out of a tree stand, we, we do work with you and uh, we'll okay. take care of you. Right. Mm -hmm. Just uh, curious. So what, what is the, and if you don't know what that's fine, we can look it up, but what is the weight of a, of a scope like that with the block and the mount weight wise? Mm -hmm. is that still let me, under let me two, check. Two pounds, maybe. I, I definitely, I think it is under two pounds. Let me check. Right, uh, just just over um, twenty ounces. Oh, with that's the mounts. great! Yeah, yeah, that so that's definitely under uh, two pounds with the mounts. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a steel tube, right? Yep, it's a steel tube, and uh, yeah, we use brass end caps, and the mounts uh, 
not to themselves or steal as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at my Henry 4570 here, and I would definitely, you know, because you can see how the barrel tapers down. So mm -hmm. I would have, like, are your mounting blocks different height from the front and rear? So right now, the way it's set up, it is. Um, I, would, I would recommend, uh, yeah, it's little, the rear is a little bit higher than the front. Right. But yeah, uh, I would. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, once we have some of these in stock, I'll we'll, I'll definitely give you a hauler and we'll send you one for uh, your videos. Cool. What's your What's your game plan? So you think in July, August, maybe? Yeah, right now we're thinking like late July, early August. Our production was a little bit impacted by the virus, but uh, we're we're getting trying to get it back up to speed right now. What What about the uh, the uh, Malcolm 8X. The Malcolm 8X, uh, we, we just got the mounts in like la la end of last week. So I, I think we're, we'll get yours out today and uh, I'll at least be shooting you a tracking numbers. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to do, I've got a cool video plan for that. I won't, I won't reveal today what it is, but yeah, I'm going to open up some eyes. I got some, uh, I got some Lehigh defense bullets I got loaded up. I'm going to open up some eyes on the 3040 Craig. <laughs> oh wow! Because <laughs> you know, the, you know the, the the standard sights on those rifles. You know, it's a military rifle. You know, but you know, iron sights. Yeah, you know, it's amazing what they shot. You know, back in World War One, the distances mm -hmm. they shot. You know, and their their ability to hit targets at extended ranges was still. Oh, yeah. You know, with iron sights, it's pretty much literally hit or miss. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you can't can't have precise aim fire at you know, six, 700 yards. Yeah, it's actually, it's cr crazy what the guys at Camp Perry are doing nowadays too. Uh, some of the guys are still shooting like MOA groups or, or tighter with iron sights at 600 yards. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think that's pretty much all we had uh, planned for today, but I really appreciate you joining the channel. Or, excuse me, let me just start that over. <laughs> You know, I really appreciate you joining us on the podcast today. Um, could you tell our, the viewers where we can find you on social media? Yeah, absolutely. So my primary social media is YouTube. So you just search AP Alpha Papa 2020 Outdoors. So it's AP 2020 Outdoors. And then um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I just actually built my own website fi finally about six months ago. So um, I've got... Typically, all my videos has all the pertinent links in the description. Um, like you said earlier, I've got a high-speed camera. And I think I told you this. When I get that eight-power uh, Malcolm, I'm going to shoot shoot the scope with the high-speed camera. And we'll see what it looks like in high speed, you know, at 1,000 frames per second. I think that'll be wow, pretty that's cool. That's gonna be so cool. That yeah, that'll be that'll be great, especially for so many of our vintage match shooters uh, who do it. They'll actually get to see what it looks like. That's great. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys for joining us. You can find us on YouTube uh, at Hilux Inc. Find us on Instagram at Leatherwood Optics, or go to our website www.hiluxoptics.com. See you guys next time. All right. We'll see you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nito.